while we're um, just waiting for a couple more people to join us, um, I'll just put this icebreaker up. Um, don't know if you've experienced a challenge in delivering construction projects, uh, which is a lot of what uh, our guests today are going to talk about. Uh, but this is an opportunity to um, make sure your chat box is working. We used to say a uh, chance to try your chat box, <laughs> but these days with so much, uh, so many Zoom and, and Teams meetings, uh, it's kind of don't need to say that anymore. Uh, people know how to do that. So we'll just give this one more minute and then we will uh, get started. Okay, it's uh, one o'clock. Why don't we get going? And uh, I don't know why my picture has uh, suddenly decided to leave the screen, but uh, my name is Carl Baxmeyer. I'm a planning manager and educational planner with Whiteman. Um, and I am going to be the facilitator for today's uh, meeting. We started this shortly after the start of the pandemic. Um, was to provide a platform uh, to share information uh, about what is happening as we faced challenges that nobody had ever faced before uh, in their in their careers. Uh, so we've gotten to do this uh, monthly um, to provide this platform. We're excited today to have uh, a discussion about what schools should consider uh, when they're planning the delivery of a construction project specifically partnering with a program manager or a construction manager. And we're going to touch a little bit on construction economics, um, what the current climate is and how that can affect um, bidding and construction. Our panelists uh, include Dr. Tom Langdon. Uh, Dr. Langdon is a part-time superintendent uh, and mentor at the Walkerville Public Schools. He has also been working as an educational consultant uh, with Whiteman. And as you can see, he has an extensive uh, background uh, in education uh, that he brings to this discussion. Our two, Everyone. Our two guests are uh, Derek Ward from the Gilbane Building Company. Uh, Derek is a senior manager at Gilbane who focuses on K-12 and public sector clients uh, throughout the region. Specifically, he assists uh, with selection of delivery methods uh, for their clients. With him is um, having just a little computer issue. With him is Stephanie Corona. Uh, Stephanie is a project executive with uh, extensive experience in the construction industry, managing over $3 billion in projects. And she really is focused on a commitment to client outreach uh, for pre-construction programming. So with that, it's a pleasure to have everyone here and uh, I will turn it over to the panelists. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate the introductions and excited to be a part of this. Thanks for uh, having us join you uh, this afternoon and talk a little bit about construction. That's always a fun opportunity for us. So. Um, what we're going to do is, is kind of walk through a sequence of options. So we're going to start with delivery method options, walk you through the ones that are most prominent in the K-12 market, and then uh, talk a little bit about the current state of our economy for construction economics and supply chain. Um, very important topics right now, especially with the climate that we're in. Um, I think, you know, what the, for the folks that are on the call, um, if there's a, a hot question or anything, feel free to stop us at any time. And, and walk us through any questions you might have specifically, especially as you see something like what you see here, kind of like an organizational uh, legend a chart where you can see the flow of contracts and the flow of relationships within each delivery method. So any questions, please feel free to stop us for clarifications. Um, but also I think what's really important is just, you know, understanding that the lens that we're coming from is, um, you know, we're not here to necessarily recommend a certain way of doing things. We're, we're really here to get for you to get the most out of it so you understand what options are available to you in the market. And then if you have specific questions on recommendations, it really is unique and tailored to each individual school client. So um, there is not a one fits all solution as it relates to delivery methods. 
Um, and Stephanie is the perfect person to walk us through that because she's worn several different hats as it relates to delivery methods. She's been on every side of the fence you can think of. So she, she understands the owner's side of things and the owner's perspective, but also understands the contractor side and the contractor's perspective. So without further ado, Stephanie, please take us away. Thanks, Derek. Um, true, I, I actually uh, spent 11 years as the owner's rep. So I actually sat on the other side of the table for, for many years. Um, but you know, I'd like to walk through very quickly the typical or, or all the different options for um, for uh, bringing on a, either a program or a construction manager or a general contractor. The first one we see here is is our traditional design bid build, and that's where uh, the owner hires an architect. The architect um, develops a full set of drawings. It goes out for public bid. They hire a general contractor, and the general contractor is locked into in uh, most of the times a lump sum price and and then um, they go ahead and under them they would they may self perform or have several subcontractors um, it's a you know i think it's a great concept for smaller projects um, quick projects um, but keep in mind you always have the if it's not on a drawing or if it's an existing condition it's open for, it can be open for a change order. And so in this model, we see a lot of times that there's, a, a, there can be a higher increase in, in uh, changes after the contract is issued. Um, next. So in our next slide here is a design bid build. And, and you know, again, that's that open bid concept. Um, you, most of the time it is the lowest, lowest prices is, is what gets it. Um, yeah, you can put in uh, certain clarifications, make sure you have X amount of uh, experience and you, and you can put some provisions to protect yourself. But again, um, you, you really get no builder input during the design process. So um, anything that needs to be tweaked to accommodate uh, unforeseen or existing conditions, it makes it tough because again, design team is now going back and potentially having to, to go back and redesign, but also the contractor is, is waiting for design changes and, and it can, it, it, you could end up missing dates. Um, next slide. So on the next one, um, again, here's your pros and cons. It's simple, it's that traditional approach. Um, you know, there's clarity to what the general contractor's role is. It's a more simplified, um, but here's your cons, you know, no input you're kind of going in hoping that whatever estimate that you're carrying is going to hold without any price checks along the way. Um, there's uncertainty about until you receive the bids. It's, it can be a slow delivery process because all those things that you would talk about during design that you can start prepping for, now you're not doing until after you bring a contractor on board. Um, and then you also don't really have any control of the subcontractors that they use. Um, and so if they wanted to, in theory, you could get two guys in a pickup truck that show up <laughs> that really don't really have safety in mind. So, um, but it's, it's a great opportunity for smaller projects. Next. Hey, Stephanie, if I can just throw something in on that one real sure. quick. I, I think that, you know, when it comes to professional services and school clients, one of the keys that school clients are most often looking for is somebody who's gonna be their partner and protect their best interests. In this case, you don't get that because they're getting, it's the low number that wins the job. And they don't need you as a reference to win the next job. They just need to be the low number. And at the end of the day, I don't think that's, that's most often what we don't see school clients necessarily looking for because what we found is that the number, ultimately the, the total project cost, there's really not much of a difference whether there's a CM or a GC delivery method. Um, in fact, most often the CM saves you money during that pre-construction, like you said, where you get that, that builder input before we break ground or before the bids go out to the street. So um, again, this methodology has been around for hundreds of years. It's like the old master builder, it's archaic. It's still available to us, but uh, the more progressive models are what we'll talk about after this. True, and that's a good point, Derek. So, you know, again, we, we talked about um, the design bid build and, and um, where, where the pros and cons are to that. Um, you know, it's uh, again, where things are not time sensitive <laughs> because you can't work out those early 
challenges that may be in play. You know, if it's ground up, that's one thing. If you're doing a renovation on your building, wow, I just really don't recommend going down this route. Um, uh, next slide. So the next thing that we wanna look at is, is doing a, a, a construction management agency. And, and that is where um, the owner would hire a construction manager early on along with their architectural team. They work together. There is um, the pre-construction, some estimating, um, co there's collaboration, there's coordination. And then um, the construction manager would help facilitate the bidding process to multiple trade contractors. Those contracts are held by the owner, but facilitated by the construction manager. So, um, uh, so it, it, we also like to call it, see I'm not at risk um, <laughs> is, another, is another name for it. So um, in, in the, you're an advocate, the CM is an advocate for the owner, um, looking for the owner's best interest. They really help provide those early pre-construction um, services. But again, they don't have a contractual obligation um, when it comes to the, uh, between the trade contractor and the CM. But most contracts are written in where the, you know, there's a reporting and that they act as the agent, obviously. Um, so here's, here's where sometimes it gets a little cumbersome for the owner. And that is when you're dealing with larger projects, smaller projects, not a big deal. Larger projects when you're bringing on, let's say 15, 20 trade contractors on board um, during the bidding process, and you're doing that at three, four schools that summer, now, you know, you're, you need to be um, basically approving, uh, instead of 15, you're approving 45 contracts coming through. And then um, it's just a lot of paperwork. Again, your CM handles the paperwork end of it, but there is, you know, there is some work that needs to occur on behalf of the owner most of the time. Um, they're the, uh, um, the accounting or, or the, uh, the accounting department within the district is, is running kind of simultaneously with what the CM has going on um, for accounting purposes. So, uh, but still many benefits to it. Next. So uh, those pros are is that um, the contractor selection is, is flexible. You really can, it's not necessarily based on dollars, though it is, but it's also based on um, the right fit. So if you're looking for somebody to help you more on the pre-construction or you know the project's gonna be challenged or your budget is tight to begin with and you need to have, you know, really to make sure you're keeping a tight eye on where, how the project is developing and, and working with the architect, a lot of pros. They're also great in making sure they throw out a wide net and uh, getting those trade contractors. There's not that adversarial relationship that you can get with the GC. Um, they're there to help you. They're there to work for you. Um, but here are some of the cons that goes with it. Again, the owner assumes all the contractual costs and, and schedule risk. Um, there's not a single point of, of contact for a contract accountability. There is, but when you get down to it and you get a bunch of attorneys and lawyers involved, in the end, it's, it's gonna be between the owner and the trade contractor. Um, and then and that goes with the coordination of any claims um, with any of the prime trades. So that, that is, that's, that's the, the con. But if you manage it properly and your CM's doing their job, you should never get to that point. So um, next. So where is this best suited? Well, it's really best suited for, I'm gonna say, small projects for sure, complicated projects, um, medium and large projects. Um, you know, if you're talking about going in and changing out whiteboards, you know, and, and uh, time clocks and all the, uh, in all the classrooms, you probably don't need a CM for that. You can get a GC. But uh, if you're looking at doing a summer renovation project, putting addition on or, or hitting multiple sites all at once, then I think your CM agent is really uh, where it's beneficial to you. Um, next. 
So the, the next one is the CM at risk. Listen, you know, if I'm an owner, I love the CM at risk. I have one point of contact. You, it's all your responsibility. I don't have to do a darn thing. I'm just telling you to do it. And I get the benefits of the pre-construction and all the things we just talked about previously. But reality is, is that it, that's very challenging. It, it's okay if you're looking at a single project, if you're building a single school, if you're building um, or a, a smaller bond issue that works. But if you're going anything larger, a larger bond issue or multiple schools, it gets to be challenging to do that. And your um, opportunity for construction managers and your pool of construction managers significantly decreases at that point. Um, next. So, uh, and here's why. Um, if, by the way, you get all the same things that you get from the CM agency. Um, you can do the fast track schedule option. There's, there's all the benefits. But here's what it comes down to as, as the issue. And it's really has to go with bonding. So when you need to bond the whole entire project, and that's what has to happen in the state of Michigan when you do bond, bond programs, and even with most um, sinking fund projects, a CM already has other projects. <laughs> You're not their only client, okay? And so when you start adding, let's say $100 million worth of bonding, over a short period of time for one district um, and they still have other projects that they need to bond to, you're starting to tax their, their bonding capacity. And um, it's challenging. So then what we see CMs do is say, instead of having all your work done in let's say three years, you start seeing them want to stretch it out over five years. So they're not holding up all of their bonding capacity all in that short period of time. That doesn't help you, that helps them. Okay, so now instead of you make, committing to your promises to your, your constituents or your, your, your uh, community of having, you know, you pass the bond and you expect something to be done in the first, a lot to be done in the first two to three years. Now you're waiting five, six, seven years because your CM can't hand, either doesn't have the staff to handle all of that at once or, um, doesn't have the bonding capacity. And now that becomes your problem. So I think there's a great thing for CM at risk if you have individual projects, but, um, but for an overall bond program, it's probably not the way to go. Next. And we talked about those pros and cons <laughs> that go with it. So, uh, um, you know, your again, your your con is is uh, it might impact your schedule. So we have uh, the C, another thing. Like I said, the best suited is for the larger projects or single individual projects where the CM at risk um, makes sense. Not to say you can't do it, but now you're just eliminating. In Michigan, I'm I'm just going to keep it real. If you're going to go CM at risk on a lar large bond issue, you're down to four people who can do it. That's it. So next, program man management. So this is a relatively, I wanna say, actually Derek and I were just talking about this before we, we got here. Program management in Michigan and throughout the United States has changed. It used to be, um, it used to be owner's rep um, and it's morphed. You know, the GC, and I'm gonna date myself, but the GC back in the day um, was a GC and a CM was a true CM that did really great pre-con from the very beginning to the end. We've now seen GCs declare themselves as CMs that still have a GC mentality, morph it with a CM, don't necessarily provide that really early, um, a CM role. There are plenty of CMs in Michigan that do that, but we're talking about the CM role that goes even before you bring on a CM. <laughs> it's talking about preparing you for the bond, getting you ready, prepared to put the language together for it, doing feasibility studies, looking at needs assessment, um, looking at demographic 
um, what you know, uh, the demographics and how they're changing in in your uh, in your district. That's what the program manager is now doing, and so the program manager has become the owner's rep. And by the way, the owner's rep used to be just be the guy that came on and was I want to call it the mediator. <laughs> He was the guy that basically mediated between the CM and the architect and then took care of like the testing agencies and all the consultants. Um, but, but our program management now is, is much more sophisticated than that. And it's really somebody who's there with you from beginning to end. They really are an extension of your staff, but they're also handling that very early selection process of your CM and your architect and your consultants and um, anybody else that you need to bring along board to help you not just establish your needs for a bond, but help you through the process and after and to the end. And, um, and they're typically they are selected before any architects or consultants. And Stephanie, actually sometimes the owner's rep is the school district's director of buildings and grounds or the director of operations, if they've had that experience before and have gone through sophisticated programs, sometimes that you don't need to outsource that person. Sometimes that's, you have that sitting right there and they can be, they're like your owner's rep. So we've seen that a lot as well. We are, you're absolutely right. And we're also seeing it where um, the program manager, it's that, and we also see sometimes that that person who is seasoned needs an extra hand an extra person to help them, you know, ma navigate through the whole entire process because they already have their, their they also have their day job <laughs> on top of, of handling this. So, um, you know, the, the program management, I think um, is a great, great idea for medium and larger programs because it really can lay out the a great foundation for success later on, making sure that you're, you're asking, you're not asking too much, but you're not asking too little. Um, really validating, I think, the need for that bond, because half the time it's selling it to the, the tax, um, to your, uh, uh, to the voters and, and making sure they understand. Hey, we're not saying this because we just want to update everything and put a fresh coat of paint on it because we feel like it. We're doing this because we did a needs assessment and here's the condition. And if we don't do something now, we're gonna have problems later on. So I think it's there. It's a great benefit. Um, next slide. So let's talk a little bit, I'm gonna veer off, but talk a little bit about market, market conditions. What a crazy year <laughs> so far. Um, you know, we have, we have seen trending several years um, that that prices have gone up on not just material, but labor. Overall construction has gone up in, in cost. I think the scary part right now is how much are they going up and where are they going? I'm gonna help you with that. Next slide. So here's what we do know. We do know that starting um, from April through February, we have seen a 14% increase in construction costs. That's a combination between material and labor across the country. Detroit and Southeast Michigan is no exception to that. Actually, we might be slightly higher, but I think we're about 14%. Why, what happened? Well, COVID is one. You can't blame it all on COVID though. We've had a lot of natural disasters <laughs> that have occurred. We've had material shortages because people have decided to, apparently an article came out today, but people have decided to stay home not go on vacation and reinvest into their homes. And um, as people are working from home and educating from home, improving their homes and, and uh, because their home is now a place that they work, not a place they, they visit at night and on the weekends. <laughs> so um, increase in fuel prices has been a, a huge issue. 30% increase in the month of January and February in, in fuel prices, and then a labor shortage labor shortage due to COVID, labor uh, shortage due to um, just an increased demand. So May to, May to July, that 3% was really 100% COVID. From August to October, that was the fires that occurred out West with a, that created a lumber shortage 
overall demand on home improvement and housing. Um, and then uh, we had some hurricanes and some floods and some natural disasters. Add that all in, that was a 7% increase. We saw a 2% decrease in the month of no November, December due to A, election, everybody was waiting to find out what was gonna happen. B, a natural slowdown that occurs in the month of November and December anyways, due to the holiday and change in, in climate. But here's the shocker, January to March, 6% increase in, in material and, and labor costs. And that is due to um, fuel. Um, still, we had some natural disasters occurring down south with, with ice, but also overall demand with people, us coming out of COVID, people are, are going back to work. And there's also a, a, a better consumer confidence that we're coming out of, out of, uh, out of the slump we've been in due to COVID. Where are we looking at for the next year through the end of 2022? We are anticipating an additional 2% increase due to a, additional fuel, uh, increase in fuel and a, and a fuel, just an increase in fuel. Um, and the uh, demand on material and labor. We see it dipping back down in November and December, but really leveling down to about 4%. So overall, we're gonna look at um, maybe seeing a 4% decrease overall from where we're at right now. But we're not, it's not gonna go back to the way things were before COVID. It's not anticipated to do that. We don't see that happening for at least a couple years at this point. So- Stephanie, one thing to add on to that is, you know, take all this, weird stuff out of the equation, depending on which part of the country you're in, we would typically carry in a stable economy anywhere between three to 5% material and labor escalation. Um, so that and, that, and that was very consistent year over year. Um, I would say in, in Michigan, we're probably closer to the 3% than the 5% year over year, um, but, but that is what we would carry in our estimates uh, in, a, in a normal stable economy. And you're right. And if you go back once, I don't know if we can go back one slide, but if you go back one slide, you'll actually see that is very consistent what, with what we've seen on, on increases in past years. We see little dips here and there, but reality is, you know, we've seen a consistent upward trend. We don't anticipate that to, to change. It's just, I don't think that if we looked at prior to COVID of March of last, beginning of March of last year at this, you know, I shouldn't say this time because this time we were shut down by then. But if we would have gone beginning of March, I don't think anybody would have anticipated a 14% increase. And, and so what has that done to overall construction? Well, it's made some owners pause some projects. Um, it's had us, and if you can go to the next slide, next two slides, not the slide, the next one, one more. It's, it's made us have to have a great understanding of where we're at in the overall supply chain process. And we're, we as owners and, and contractors, we're in, the, we're in four and five in the supply chain. So where, where can we have some influence to help control those costs? Well, we, we have to look at lean project delivery. I think you have to look at trying to uh, look at some cost savings in value engineering to look at alternatives. I think you have to really control that schedule to make sure you don't have downtime and lost time. Um, and then I think you, you have to have the ability to have some price agreements in place. Try to, try to do um, more with, instead of um, when you're doing large purchase of, of let's say multiple uh, buildings, you can get a better price for it. I think you gotta start looking outside the box and, and looking and being creative. Um, next slide. So we know right now where inventories are trending, we actually track that internally. We're, we're very fortunate that we do that. And we actually, if you want, we put out, I think it's a monthly, um, Joe Pirro puts it out to anybody who wants it, a monthly, where are we sitting at with the overall supply chain? Where's the shortage is coming? We actually know that steel is actually not gonna be, it has always been in the past. That's not it, it's drywall. <laughs> That's gonna be our, our problem this summer. 
Lumber, yes, we already knew that, but drywall is gonna be our issue. Um, and that's where the shortage is coming. The other, um, we know that uh, supply, the supply chain is slowing. Um, and it's just because the demand is too high. We don't have all of our workers back to work right now across the country for various reasons. So um, next. So where does that leave, leave us? <laughs> well, the best thing to do is to try and mitigate some of the risk, right? Try to manage trade scopes of work, try to have it so we can get the best bang for our buck, make sure that we, we invest in labor on workforce development, look at going outside of your square box area and start looking regionally at, at getting some of your supplies and your resources. This includes manpower and this also includes on your material. We, I mean, we are becoming a global economy. It's time that I know that there's a lot of things that are written in that you can, it's a buy Michigan only, but you may not get it <laughs> this time around if you just have a buy Michigan only. So we're going, you have to start looking and going outside of, of just of, of your postage stamp uh, zip code. Well, uh, and, next. And, oh, Stephanie, and, and I guess Derek as well, you know, when you think about it, you, you said you were kind of the tail end, everybody kind of fills the bag and you guys are, you know, have to hold on to the bag and explain what's going on. You have those people from the one through three right there, they are not held accountable by the local client. They, you know, they work pretty much behind the scenes and they can do, you know, they can make it as lean as they, as they can. And that is a disadvantage, you know, to say, okay, we want to have people from our, even when you say Michigan, um, I'll tell you as a superintendent, they want them from their county, you know, right. if not from their village or city. And those are the things that are going to just, but they don't equate that. You know, when, when you hamstring you folks, the professionals, they don't see that as a bump in cost. That's just, a, you know, that's just off to the side. And now we still want what we want. And by the way, when we started this, we kind of figured you'd make, make it so that we could probably add a little more to it. And you're going to, you know, you know, you're going to cut things down and, and be, you know, great miracle workers here. And then we're going to have more money. But the truth is, with these kind of numbers, it's not going to go that way if we don't, and it probably won't even then, but if we don't, you know, think as far as the big picture and we need to find the best prices, the best, you know, labor, and it may not be in our county and our either state or even in our country. And that's going to be a hard sell to the client. And I don't know, I, I feel bad for you guys to have to, to go through that. The <laughs> superintendent will bear some of that, but we're always pointing over there to say, well, you know, <laughs> it's not my job. I'm just here to make sure it goes well, you know? Well, and you're absolutely right. It, it is a hard sell. And, and you know, we've seen um, districts where it, it took three, four iterations of only having one or two bidders. Now you're accused of not putting a far enough net out of, of giving it to the same people. And, you know, you're, you're not sharing the wealth and, you know, it's a no win situation <laughs> on that one. Well, yeah, at our school, we were looking for it's six months just for a, a controller for our HVAC system. I mean, a simple thing, you know, I thought it was simple. Six months later, we finally got the enough bids. We wanted two bids. We couldn't even find one, you know? So I, I don't envy you folks one bit. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we, it's, we've had to come think outside the box and it, it's, it's, um, it's a journey, right? It's a journey. So so I, I see I lost my screen. Is, was that my, it's time for you to cut it, Stephanie, or <laughs> the presentation? I, I that, no, no, it's not. I, there must have been a computer glitch there and, and I lost lost connectivity for a moment. Oh, it's okay. Well, um, so I think that the next thing I wanted to talk about is, okay, so, you know, where do I go? When do I bring those people on board? Um, you know, I, you've given me a lot of food for thought. So, what makes sense? Okay, here's what makes sense. Here's just the simple, and it, it's, it really comes down to what your preference is and what your needs are. And, and your, it, the, for a program manager, are you looking, do you have a lot of upfront work that needs to happen? I think it's like the next slide. Um, do you have a lot of work, upfront work that needs to happen? Do you have a lot of pre-construction? Are you really not sure 
on, you know, if you're going for a bond issue, you better make sure you need what you need for the next 20 years. So you really should do a needs assessment. Um, and so in order to make sure you're getting, hey, it's not, you know, Detroit's going for what, 1.7 billion. Ann Arbor got a billion. Grand Rapids got close to a billion. It's not unheard of to have larger numbers anymore. I think it scared people. But the other part is, is that when you, when you have 20 or 15 years or 20 years to have that bond um, last and, and your buildings need to last just as long, or you got to bring them up to this century. Most of our buildings in Michigan were built in the 70s. Um, you know, we have a lot of post-World War II, but we also have a lot of buildings that are built in those 60s and 70s that don't have the envelope for sustainability, don't have the energy efficiency that they really need, don't have the air quality that's required anymore for students. You know, these are things that we could kick that can down the road 15 years ago, but we can't kick it down the road anymore. So... That's where I think you got to bring a program manager on board is to really do a true needs assessment and where you need to be at for your bond before you go and ask for the money. Then bring on an architect and engineer very closely after that you're going to have to have an idea of rendering and you know you got to show some pretty pictures to the public. Bring a construction manager on board. You can do that before or after the bond, but before you, before no later um, before you start schematic design process. And then you have your consultants, you bring those on at all different times. Your trade contractors come on board after you have design done. If you, if you decide to go the me method without a program manager, then it's really high, highly recommended that you bring that architect and that construction manager on board at the same time. And then you bring your consultants on board and your trade contractors. Stephanie, I'd say I'd add the only asterisk to that is kind of depending on the size of the program, right? The, what's what's the scope of work? What is the, what is the needs assessment telling us? Um, is is what the needs assessment might help define what scope of work you'll embark on? Also, the district finances might also help decide what you can embark on, and also the you know financial willingness of your community to uh, approve a bond measure, um, or unless you are fortunate enough to have district finances in house to where you can afford something. So I think. There are asterisks and caveats within that structure, but I think getting good advice that um, you know, the way that we would approach it with a client is, you know, look at your situation and, and say, you know, what's in your best interest? Because at the end of the day, as a professional service, we want to protect the best interests of our clients. Unlike the general contractor mode, we don't have to be the low number to win our next work. We need good references. And if we do good work for by being good people, good consultants, and we have good references that will vouch for us and say, you know what, they look out to protect the school's best interests, and that's why we would recommend that company. That's really what you're ultimately looking for. And I can say very, very, uh, just knowing the folks on this call with the Whiteman folks too, we've known each other for well over a decade. You have well-intentioned consultants here who would put forth good recommendations that are in the school's best interests. Right, and, and that's a good point, Derek. And, and that's why I said, you know, once you get a program manager on board, you may need to bring that construction manager on board much sooner to help you do the needs assessment. Um, you know, depending on how many buildings you have, or, or at least say, hey, what what do I uh, I need I need a second set of eyes, or or to for your team to come together and say, we only have this much money. How do we best use it? But that your program manager is going to help you with that process. So, um, I guess. What I'd like to say is that if, if you have, if you don't get a program manager by default, it's going to be the superintendent. And, it is, yeah. You know, it really becomes that way. And if you have a superintendent that doesn't have a, you know, I don't want to say it wrong, but a lot of savvy or understanding of how this process works, it's going to be frustrating for the, you know, the architect, for the CM. It's going to be a, a, a lesson in a lot of meetings. And because the, that board knows if they really want to complain about something and try to get action, they go to the superintendent. It's a huge headache taken away when you have somebody who is competent and understands the process. And you know, the other piece is, is that a program manager gets, you'll take some of the other things that are going to occur. You have, you have architects that try to say how to sell a bond. You have, you know, CMs that want to get in the game too. And 
if the program manager is there from the beginning, they can help have that visual of what's really what the community needs, wants. They can get a taste of that and kind of get ahead of the game before everybody else jumps into the into the whole thing. And, you know, basically that's what everybody wants, just the communication and, you know, a program that's going to go in, taken care of, leave within a considerable, you know, closeness of what the, the, the due date is. I think everybody understands, except for the board and the superintendent, maybe in some respects, understand it may not be like the very day that we said we're going to get this done, but it's going to be a lot longer if you if you have the same kind of strife I've experienced in some of the projects I've done. It becomes a mess, for sure. Yeah, and you know, keep in mind, yeah, just let's just call it what it is. You know, an uh, architect, their fee is based on a certain percentage of the overall cost, right? A CM, their fee is based on the overall cost that they're overseeing, of uh, price that they're overseeing. But a program manager should not be that. I want to make that clear. A program manager should not get a fee on the overall dollar value that is being spent or the bond issue. Their fee should be based on whatever they bring to the table, should be on their manpower or whatever specific service they bring. It should never be on the overall construction or bond because that's a conflict. Are they really looking out for your best interest at that point when it's taught when their financial success is tied to uh, how many dollars are spent? Right. And, and Derek, you mentioned alluded to earlier, and I think it's so accurate is when you have your own person on site and it's, you know, it's, it's probably going to be your facilities manager or director. If that person's been there a while, and if they have savvy, the understanding of what's going on in the, in the district, where it should be going to, has that vision, it's, they can be that, you know, at least be available for the, the, the manager to talk to. That's a huge thing because that person a lot of times has panache with the community, with the board, can get out there and, you know, explain the fact that, yeah, we had a little hiccup here, but that's just natural. We're going to get through this. Those are the kind of things that are kind of priceless when you're dealing with something like this, it stops those little roadblocks that the arguments and, and the feeling of despair by some people, it kind of assuages that, those feelings, and it just makes the project go that much, you know, is there's gonna be issues no matter what, but it helps the project continue on. And as long as that person is not meddling all the time and asking every three minutes, what are you doing now? It, it can be a real positive for the project. Right. So th that kind of wraps up what, uh, um, you know, our, our presentation. Um, see, there's some questions. <laughs> oh, we had some, we had some questions, uh, but you've really covered uh, so much of this uh, as we expected during your presentation. Um, so I, I, I can answer number three, because I think sure. there's this, when is the best time? So. If you're going to bring a PM on board, you really need to bring a PM on board as early as possible. But um, I would say no later than a year prior to you even thinking about um, putting a shovel into the ground. A CM um, agent, you need to bring on, and even a CM at risk, but you need to bring a CM on board. Let's talk about if you're talking summer work, this just purely summer work. You really need to bring them on in April of, or May of the following of the year prior to the summer you want to do the work. Then you're doing the design process through the summer, wrapping it up in theory in the fall. And then the best case scenario is if you can start your early trade contracts and bidding those out at the beginning of December. So then you're ready for, in theory, to put for, for board approval in January, and you have somebody on board by the end of January, beginning of February. The people you're going after are those who are looking for work for next summer. They're eager. They want to start filling their stomachs right now, get the bellies filled, and get, get a comfort level. When you start waiting to bid out trade contractors to February and March, um, you start losing out. The, the pool gets much and more, much less. People who are typically used to doing school work are probably already under contract and have already bid. People that you have left 
or people that are um, may not have full capacity for you. They'll take your work because they have some capacity, but they may be challenged at that point in order to meet the need, your summer needs. Hey, Stephanie, I would only add to that as well said, the only other thing that we'll see is that uh, it could also raise the cost of your projects because if I've got my plate full, sure, I'll take on more work, but I want more money for it too. I've, I've, met, I've met my needs as a company, as a trade contractor company. I'm comfortable with the, our book of work right now. If I want to take on more, now I can make more money, which just means higher costs to the school district, which means we're not maximizing your investment into the schools, which is the whole goal to begin with. So the timing of, the, of going out to bid and the timing of going to market is critical. True. The whole supply and demand thing, right? It is, exactly right. especially right now, so. Wow, 14%, I guess I wasn't aware. That's a... Uh, and then down the road, we have the potential of some inflation with all the money that's being put out. And, and uh, you know, we've had a pretty good CPI for the last several years. You know, we, we're just having all those questions. The feds are announcing today or tomorrow about whether interest rates are going up. All those things, there's the variables are just, I guess you don't think about when the best time is because there's never a best time, is there? There is, and you can plan all day long, but, you know, I, I don't think it, there's some fact, I mean, the natural disaster thing is the thing that <laughs> you never know when it's going to happen. We know that they happen, but I don't think, I don't think anybody thought that there was going to be a whole bunch of ice that shut down all of Texas. I mean, that, nobody saw that one really coming. And, um, you know, we always know that there's fires that happen out West. I don't think anybody thought they were going to be as large and as long in duration. I, well, absolutely. You know, we can see some indicators, like maybe a little less of that forest control, right? And, and you know, they may guess there's going to be more hurricanes, but, you know, that's, to me, it's an educated guess. So, again, I think that you have to, once you get the bonds, you try to, like you suggested, you got to get in there and get those people as early as possible so that we can, you can secure them and make sure that the project goes as best as possible. As it, you know, with the best people, too, you don't always want the best price. I, you know, when I was younger, yeah. Yeah, I love the lowest bid. Now I'm very wary of the lowest bid. And I think, you know, <laughs> how much is really going to cost me? What, what's the cost going to be on this? So. Hey, Stephanie and, uh, and Derek, uh, what, what are the biggest challenges that you face uh, with your owners? You know, and, and I guess what I'm looking for is, you know, what, what is it that you need out of your owners for you guys to be effective as program managers? Well, I think, I think it's engaging everybody outside of the construction circle. You know, a lot of times it's hard to get projects kicked off in design because you need information on programming and other internal entities from within the school district that aren't part of construction, the end user. And the end user, you know, we're seeing a, a change in how we educate, not because of COVID, but before COVID. We have, there's, they're challenged in when do I pull the trigger for the new type of education that's out there. And so there, there's difficult conversations that need to be had internally and it's the kick the can down the road, you know? And, and so you're kicking the can down the road and meanwhile your whole design team and everybody's sitting there waiting saying, we need an answer. <laughs> You know, how are we, how are we laying this out? What type of teaching are, are you going to uh, an open floor plan? Or are you going to stick with the old traditional way of doing things? How are you, what are you doing? And it's, that's where I think of the big challenges right now that we are, we're hearing from, from districts across Michigan. Yeah. And Stephanie, uh, that is one of the specialties that this team has is to be able to go in there and do that. Do you ever see or foresee, you know, as part of the program management delivery process that you would maybe consult with a firm like, like Whiteman that has that expertise to go in and begin to develop that so that, you know, you talked about being lean, uh, you know, and getting to the point because of the, uh, the construction costs. And I'm just trying to remember the, uh, the exact term you used, but um, 
in order to do that consistently across buildings, across, um, let's say, grade levels, and very specific to a particular school district, because each school district is different, you know, they have different strategic goals, uh, in order to provide the, the designers that information uh, in order to streamline things. Yes, we do see a need for it. And I will tell you, it's been challenging. Um, people are just starting to come on board. I think Whiteman is one of the few firms that is out there that has that capability to sit down with the end user and work them through that process. I think there's a, way too many design firms out there right now that are still in the, um, you tell me what you want, and I will go ahead and design it for you. But the, but the owner, the, the district, they know they wanna take that next step. They don't know how that layout's supposed to be other than if they do a Google search, you know? Um, and, and even then you're not sure. That's why you hired the professional, right? Is to tell me, what am I supposed to do? Um, but, but right now we're seeing a, a struggle, a huge struggle right now. And COVID has only added to it. COVID is what, so here's, here's the changes that has happened literally in nine months across Michigan with K through 12. And, and I, and this is what we're seeing the need for having an actual library. You know, there's online libraries. Now people resisted it for years. Well, guess what? switch your media center and your library to a more online platform for your library and you've just freed up space in your building. Yeah, like a learning commons or a resource uh, commons, something like that. Right, ventilation. Or a makerspace. Yeah. Or a makerspace. Yeah, makerspaces. Steam and STEM, huge right now. If, and, and if you don't have it, you're gonna have a demand for it by your, your parents within the next three years. So you got to create those spaces. What do those look like? What does the program look like? That's the other thing. I mean, you can create the space, but you got to know what, what you're putting, what the program is going to be. Um, and, and then obviously the online learning, you know, it's not going away. Okay. I think we will always have a hybrid. We had an issue when flu season comes around in Michigan, where schools are shutting down for several days because we got to disinfect the school because you know a third of the school has the flu. It's we have a pandemic that opened our eyes to it. This will not be the first, and it's not going to be the last. Yeah, kids aren't going to like that because there will be, there will be no more snow days. I have a feeling that's exactly <laughs> it. I have a feeling that's where we're going. The, the no but, more snow day or the ability to stay, if you're homesick, where let's say you got pink eye or so, something that, that doesn't keep you in bed, but something that keeps you away from infecting everybody else, you know, you stay home and you don't miss a beat on your education. So. I, I think I think the key word of the day is gonna be not not as much as hugely targeted, but more of an idea of being flexible because, you know, these theories all kind of go around and around and, and, you know, we know that to just have one standard building is not going to work. It, you know, we talk about things changing every three years. Well, it's even faster than that. Sometimes technology is such a, such a moving target. So to be able to be flexible with the building construct and, and structure, I think that's going to be huge going forward. Well, you know, the office spaces and what, what business has been doing in the last couple of years, I think um, schools are going to take a page from that. And that is the days of you coming into the school, being assigned a classroom, and that is your classroom, whether you're using it during that hour of the day or not, is, is, is probably going to be gone. It's going right. to be where it's a place for you to land, do your work, and then there'll be places for you to have your office hours. Exactly. And then someone else is going to use the same thing. It, it's going to have to be a lot of moving things, I think. Yeah. Or being able to be changed very quickly on the fly. But that's a, that's a change that is difficult right now because <laughs> you've been doing it the same way for so many years. So, and exactly. that's where, you know, 
that that's where the challenge is for for I think a, a lot of our our owners. Yeah, yeah exactly there's, right. Yeah, and I was going to say um, change happens very slowly, and it's like, yeah, I'm for change, but you know, don't make me change, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've seen it happening all over the country where, you know, a lot of these things have been implemented and, you know, a lot of it really stems from the leadership within the school districts, within the building, um, you know, within the program that help, you know, move that needle in a direction that's more conducive to the types of graduates that, you know, are our society and industry needs. So uh, we just got to keep plugging away at it. And, um, you know, if that is definitely something that, uh, you know, you're seeing struggles with, there may be a way to, to overcome that so that, you know, we're not spending an extra 14% on something that, you know, could go back into the building. Right. Um, Anyways, well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and your insight. And this was very useful uh, information and just the uh, the synopsis on uh, where construction costs have gone. I did not realize that it had gone up 14%. I thought it was probably more in the seven to eight, but you doubled on me. Wow. <laughs> that that, that explains at least. <laughs> yeah, that at least explains one of our projects. Uh. Well, you've provided yeah. great information. Uh, we're going to summarize all this and post it on our uh, next in our next newsletter. Uh, I want to, on behalf of Whiteman and everybody, I want to thank uh, Derek and Stephanie for giving us of your time and, and insight. Um, and uh, it was really uh, enlightening in so many areas, as George just said. Um, well, our next town hall will be on April 24th at uh, one o'clock. And um, <clears throat> while this will be on the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the summary, we will provide the uh, contact information for both Derek and Stephanie and uh, to enable people to reach out to them directly. Again, I want to thank you, uh, everyone, for their time. And uh, we look forward to the next uh, Wednesdays with Whiteman. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Stephanie. Great presentation. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. We appreciate being part of it. Thank you all for having us. All right. Enjoy all the right. rest. Of, enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Sounds good. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Oh, there that's you right. Way to go. <laughs> go green. <laughs> there and go white. <laughs> That's right. Go blue. Uh oh, what? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.